my name is Vicente Diaz. I'm from uh, Barcelona, Spain, and well, I was maybe uh, maybe you recognize me for the last nine years and a half in actually in the great team in Kaspersky Lab. Now in Barbados Total, and today we are having this workshop to show you guys around uh, how we can do cool stuff. Uh, in terms of threat hunting with virus um, total, uh, we want to make something practical, something that you can use in, let's say, in your investigations to show you a little bit around. Hopefully, this will be useful for everybody. Um, but uh, before we start, uh, let me share credits with who deserve uh, Juan, Jose, Brandon, and Gerardo. They all help in this presentation, and well, these are the guys behind this, and just the uh, the guy presenting today. All right, so I hope, or I guess, that everybody knows virus total at this point, but in case you don't, yes, uh, let me make a very quick introduction um, who we are. Uh, so virus total is not only this uh, nice website where you check if some binary is malicious or not, and you check uh, what are the verdicts from the antivirus, but also is uh, a very, powerful source of intelligence. Actually, uh, you can call it like the Google of malware if you want. Um, basically, we have our intelligence services inside of VirusTotal with powerful tools uh, on, on, on top of a really huge amount of data that you can use for searching, for hunting, and for many other different purposes. Um, what we do with the data we get is Basically, we get as much information as we can. We make all the relationships. We detonate the samples in different uh, sandboxes. We analyze the binaries. We get the metadata. We try to relate as much as we can. So uh, that's why we are providing as much as we can for everybody to do these investigations. All right. So what is threat hunting? Uh, I'm assuming that in SAS, this is something that we don't really need to, to explain because probably most of you guys you know about this. Um, but uh, threat hunting, just in a nutshell, to explain it in two seconds, is when you guys are investigating something, uh, you want to get as much visibility as you can for any campaign. So let's say you are in some forensic analysis uh, and you have some artifacts, you want to have the whole picture, you want to know all the indicators of compromise, you want to know where to look for some stuff, uh, you want to know what is next, you know, uh, you want to know what is uh, what is left uh, in the attack. So you need to know the TTPs, you need to know uh, as much as possible. Um, also, this is the way how you detect new threats. Uh, basically, when you hear about all these campaigns that are being discovered, like the nice research we saw yesterday and many others, uh, we can also look for anomalies, for things that we don't have any idea what is this, or for something that may be interesting. And we also want to get as much inf information as we can. So that's basically uh, why we are doing in threat hunting, right? We are trying to get as much as we can from some small pieces. We want to make the whole puzzle. Very good. So we know what is virus total. We know what is uh, threat hunting. I will try to go quick to the interesting parts, uh, also because we don't have much time. But I want to explain to you what are like different uh, tools that you can use uh, in virus total intelligence to do this threat hunting. So I will go one by one. Uh, but I will just concentrate on what is most interesting, hopefully. So let's just start with what is BT grep. Um, well, BT grep, uh, if you are familiar with the grep command from Linux, is is quite self-explanatory, right? So you can basically search for anything inside of the collection of uh, data we have into all the petabytes of binaries we have. You can search for something you consider interesting. How to do that? Uh, basically, we will see later with the interface, but you need to use the, the command content. And from there, you can search for anything you want, either in ASCII or in EXA. Well, uh, strings or EXA, actually. It doesn't matter if it is ASCII or if it is Unicode. So uh, just for you to have some information how this is done, this is an index. It has like a minimum size, so you cannot like make you know, uh, search for for uh, for two bytes or something like that. 
uh, at least it's 32 bits. And you will get all the samples that we have in our collection in less than 60 seconds. This is like our SLA. And what is interesting is that you can use wildcards and you can use most of uh, string conditions that you use in Jara, like basic uh, Boolean logic. Um, if you're not familiar with Jara, we will see in one second. And also one cool thing is that all the samples we have, uh, we try to get as much uh, from there as possible. We try to unpack, we get all the macros outside, we uh, get VBL code. Uh, so everything we can find, we will put there in making this search uh, much easier. And um, we will see retro hands later as well, but this is great for that. Uh, you can make your favorite search and from there later, you can create your yarbull for retro hunting. Uh, we will see all of this later. We are just making this introduction. So what can I search for? Uh, let's just start with the basic stuff. In this case, we can search for strings, right? Um, let me just show you how to do it. Uh, so this is uh, just some trick bot sample. Uh, you can go into content and you can directly search from here. As I told you, you can use the content modifier, but if you want, you can simply go here, find your favorite string inside the content. Uh, I was, I'm thinking that maybe I will make it bigger, it will be better. And you just click and automatically you will search. So you see here this content. Uh, in this case, we are using this in, in hex uh, to search inside automatically. As you see, you just need to go and click. Um, well, this is maybe a bit too strict. Uh, for instance, in this case, how we can get more results, uh, just skipping the last part where uh, uh, from the PDB file. Again, PDB, PDB files uh, are great for searching because they usually are very specific for some malware families. This is basically, basically the internal path where the project was saved from the developer. So this is always something good, but if you don't want to be very strict, you can always put these wildcards or you can skip some part. Um, let me show you, for instance, uh, in this case where we are using these wildcards here at the beginning for the unit letter and then at the end also to provide some flexibility. Yes, let me show you in a second uh, here to make this content search. So basically it's the same idea. We have the same, but we are using some uh, flexibility in our search. So here you see that we have more files, in this case, six. So what is we are finding here, if we go to content and we quickly move to the PDB, you see in this case is x86, for instance, uh, in another one, if we go to the content and we look for the PDB is a DE installer. So you see, you can, you can play this, uh, uh, with these expressions to make it more flexible, which is, is great. Um, Unicode, obviously, is not only ASCII. Remember that we can also check uh, for Unicode inside of our strings. Uh, actually, if you are doing, by any chance, the, the Yara training uh, from Kaspersky, uh, you will use this in some exercise as a pro tip. <laughs> Uh, and what is good, as I told you before, and you can see in this slide, we have all these logical operators. So what is this example about? This example actually is about some uh, real spoof loader. And uh, in some cases, these guys are using the PDB. In some cases, they are not. So you see, basically, we have two conditions with this OR operand. In one of them, we have the PDB. In the other, we don't. So we are looking for something different. So you see, if you're familiar with Jira rules, we are approaching more and more to this logic, right? We are like making this condition more and more complex in order to, 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 to find something interesting, which is all why uh, this uh, threat hunting is about. Um, actually, something I personally didn't know uh, is that you can specify with an offset where you want to start searching for some, uh, we can do regular expressions, but we can do something that is pretty similar. You can see here this combination <clears throat> of uh, strings, uh, characters, and hex. And then we have some buffer where we can find uh, some um, bytes inside, and then how it ends. And you can see here at zero, meaning this is the offset where we are going to start searching for this. Again, this is something very specific, but in some cases may be useful. So why not? If we have this possibility, we can always use it. 
Uh, pro tips. Uh, always try to use the most specific substrings that you can, um, because this will make everything uh, quicker, obviously. And especially the common substrings allow to use them at the beginning and at the end. Um, this is logical, just you know, to go directly to the uh, hash table where we have like all the different entries that are corresponding to this, because you are starting to search for what is more uncommon from the beginning of the string. Uh, something interesting for you also is that we have uh, not only content, we have also content experimental. And what is this? This is actually available for all of our users of intelligence, PT intelligence. Um, but this allows like additional stuff. In this case, we have different operators we can use like positive size and type, for instance. Um, this is great because it's also providing you with more tools for your search. Uh, at the moment, this is experimental as self-explanatory uh, in the command, but um, if everything goes well, this will be adopted and at some point will replace the current content. So we will have, uh, let's say, this even cooler uh, content search. All right, so this was pretty basic. These are some ideas uh, what we can do. Uh, you see at the end, well, we started searching for something like in a grep. Uh, we were putting like more and more modifiers. And at some point we have something that is similar to a Yara rule. So what is a Yara rule? Uh, I'm not going to explain what is a Yara rule uh, in, in SAS. So don't worry, don't disconnect yet. Um, but I hope everybody knows what is uh, Yara. So just to make sure if you don't, you can quickly take a look. But basically it's the tool of choice uh, for any analyst, I would say, to uh, search for different uh, malware using different patterns, using different uh, uh, characterization that we can create. So we can create rules dedicated to find some malware that we know. Now, uh, we are going to play a small game. So I don't know if you guys are fans of Pokemon, maybe some of you. Uh, you remember in Pokemon that you need to name this Pokemon in the, in the post. So I have a uh, name this Yara game for you. Uh, so I think there are cool prizes. So we will, we will see who is able to tell me what is this Yara? Do you recognize this Yara? Let's leave like, I don't know, 10 seconds. Actually, I don't know if you guys are even replying in the in the chat. I cannot see from here. So, you know, I'm just going to leave a little bit of time. Uh, hopefully some of you recognize. I think this one, if, if, you, if you take a look, is pretty easy. Maybe you can say who is the actor behind of this maybe is familiar for you. All right, uh, I don't want to kill all the time playing this. Uh, so if someone uh, got the right answer. Congratulations. Uh, I, I think that Novikov will send a really cool prize to you. Uh, but this is basically a Yara for detecting Turla stuff. Maybe you remember Neuron. This was released by NCSC from the UK. Uh, but I just wanted to show you how a Yara rule looks like in case that you never saw one. So basically you have these strings like the ones we were searching for. And you can see we have in the condition uh, we play with Boolean logic, like we want so many of those, uh, that many of uh, different strings in this uh, position and or. So we just play with different conditions and then we have some modules uh, to make it even uh, easier and, and to have more flexibility. But I'm not going to talk about Yara rules, I, I promise. I assume that everybody knows Yara rules here. Very good. Um, so what can you do with your rules uh, on VT? Um, actually, Aristotle is kind of the, the, the home of Yara. <laughs> so we can do many, many things. I will just explain you a little bit uh, uh, some cool stuff you can do with Yara. The first thing you can do is retro hands. I guess everybody knows retro hands. Uh, basically, you are like uh, throwing your Yara rule against uh, our collection and you will scan how many uh, files can you find the, the, through your YAR rule. Uh, in this case, uh, you will see, you will get the result. It takes some time because we need to go through uh, a couple of files. Uh, so, well, this is how it works. The only thing here is that YAR rules that you use for retrohand, they need to be pure uh, YAR rules. 
So I, I will explain why uh, pure Jara rules or why I mean by pure Jara rules, uh, because now I'm going to explain you some rules that are actually not pure <laughs> Jara rules. So in this case, this is another mode. You can use your rules instead of retro hand is called life hand. So what is life hand? Basically, you are uh, scanning with your rules anything that goes into virus total. So you have this live stream where you are like analyzing everything that comes into virus total and you will receive an alert every time uh, there is something interesting for you. So these are live, uh, live uh, hands. Now, what is interesting here is that in live hands, you are not limited to, let's say, typical YAR rules. You can enhance your YAR rules with cool stuff. So let me show you a little bit. Actually, uh, if you're being, uh, if you've been using JAR rules, you know that you can import different modules. Everybody is using, for instance, PE module. Uh, so we have also BT module. And what is in there? Basically, you have access to all the metadata that we can find. You can have access to all the tags that we are using to the different detections. Uh, not only that, also to the behavior of the files, as we will see. Uh, so here you have. You can check the, the, the documentation here. You have a few examples, like for instance, in this rule, we are checking if uh, the file is malicious by at least one antivirus engine, the file type, if it is a new file, if it is submit from China, and if any of the signatures contains Zbot. So you, you can play with any ideas that you have. Um, one interesting thing that you can do also is check the behavior. So behavior is when we detonate the sample in different uh, virtual machines, you can check for what the sample is doing. And here you have also a couple of examples. Yeah, for instance, you can check that it's dropping some file and that the name of the file that is being dropped, uh, it's something that we are looking for. We can search for a given mutex. This is pretty cool, I think. Or not even that, we can check for the behavior in a more generic way. For instance, we have these behavior traits and you can check if the, the file somehow is doing something that we or the virtual machine is qualifying as per persistent. So also this is very, very interesting. Well, uh, you can combine all of this. Um, so you see that in reality, what all these searches all these modifiers can be used for a search in, in VTeam. At the same time, can be kind of translated into a YAR rule. So it's kind of a connection, which is good because you can like do the search and then you can create your YAR rule and leave it on live hand. So for instance, I created some YAR rule here. Let's check all the documents that have more than 10 detections are submit at least by three people. And they have macros and they are submit in the last 15 days. Why we want Something like that. Well, let's see that. I don't know. We are interested in see what is malicious that maybe is being sent by uh, phishing messages. So let's let's check this. Yes, out of curiosity. All right. So we find like five files here that are like uh, following this pattern that they are being uploaded and they have macros and they are documents and they are malicious and everything. So for instance, we can create this life hand and feed our systems. I will leave this open because I want to show you more stuff about this in one second. But for the moment, let's move on. Again, the idea is that you can create these complex searches and from the searches, you can also create your YAR rules and do your life hand. Um, I, I, guys, I, I think that, you know, all of this will be better in a longer workshop. I'm sorry to be rushing. Ideally, we will be doing these experiments, tests and everything, right? But this is what we have today. Now, what else can we do? We can think about all these possibilities, create uh, all these modifiers, our rules, but, you know, we we'll start getting some artifacts here. Uh, we are advancing in our investigation. One of the most powerful tools is similarity, because here we can like uh, search all right, uh, what, what else is similar to this? What else could be related? What else have some uh, thing in common with the malware I'm checking? And actually similarity is a very powerful tool. We will take a look into this. Uh, yes, uh, we will start with something that is probably the most intuitive, which is visual similarity. It means that they look the same. 
uh, in terms of some icons, in terms of a PDF, or in terms of some office documents, they externally look exactly the same. For instance, you can see here, uh, the example is very easy to understand. You are looking for something similar with this same icon. Um, let's get back to the results from before, right? So for instance, if we see here the icons, I was curious about them. And one of them, if we check the content, uh, we go to preview. So you can actually check uh, what is this thingy that we have here. Uh, remember, this is the files with macros, documents, et cetera. That is not charging now, of course. Yeah. So you see, this is a trick that they are using for you to uh, activate the macro, right? To enable content. Now, the cool thing is that if you want to search for similarity, you just need to click here. And uh, here you have a new tab where we are searching. You say you see here this main icon dash. So we are searching for all these files that are similar to this one. And you see, this is quite a big campaign. And uh, we just found it with a few clicks. Uh, now, other than executables, uh, as we saw, we can also search for PDF. And uh, here we have also, or I have an example for Emotet that I think is interesting. So just let me show you super quick. Oops. First, let's go to the file. Emotet, again, and uh, here we have this icon. We click here and we go for similarity. Uh, in this case, with the preview of the file. So why is this interesting? So here you see all this looks similar, but if you see the names of the files, this is Citibank, this is Citigroup, this is Citibank, this is um, Citibank again. So if you go into any of them and we check the preview, actually the content is not exactly the same. They are like, uh, customizing for different banks and they are having like, even if they have this, the similar appearance, the content is not exactly the same. So it means that doing this kind of search, uh, you can find stuff that is being abused, uh, that is being like using these lures for the, for the customers or for the victims in this case. But in reality, they are like different. So you are not searching for something exactly the same. Um, Oh, no preview available. Sorry for that. Uh, I think I, I was checking this before. Well, this is not so critical, but I would like to show you. All right, so this is the Wells Fargo and you see that this is for Wells Fargo. And well, just take my word, if we check for uh, city, we will see city as well. So this is very cool. We can find like, like all these phishing campaigns, for instance, um, similar with office documents, for instance, uh, in APT attacks that you are sending to different victims, the lure document, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is actually one of them, but I don't think we need to check. All right, so visual similarity is pretty easy to understand because it's pretty intuitive. Now let's go for more similarity stuff. Uh, why we want more similarity uh, if we have visual similarity? Well because binary files are complex, they have a structure. So we have different ways to find something that is similar. There is not one single unique way to go for similarity. That's why we have multiple similarity. I want to quickly, quickly go through different similarity methods that we can use. So um, we will see later, if you go into one file, you will see that we have bhash, authenthash, imhash, ssd. So what is all this about? bhash actually is our own hash where we create this heuristic based in different characteristics of the file. Actually, if you find with the similar to, uh, you can see here this similar to, uh, basically this is what you are doing. Uh, the thing is that when you are searching by similar to, it's a bit fuzzy, so you don't look for exactly the same content, right? Uh, but we have vhash, which is our own hash, uh, trying to cluster different things that are like structurally related. Authentic hash is something that I, I think Microsoft introduced. Uh, signing like different files with different applications is kind of signature. Imhash is basically the import table hash. This is deep, it's well known. Call blocks uh, is where we are uh, basically uh, 
running the binary through a disassembler and trying to find the, the, the structure of the different code blocks, right? So how can we use the similarities with code similar to? Um, we also have uh, hashes in terms of behavior, these D hashes, uh, uh, given different sandboxes, we are trying to find if they behave in a similar way. Uh, rich headers, we can also find. So you see, there are like different ways to do this um, similarity. And we show you a few of them. Now, I want to demo very quick something we can do with that. Uh, first of all, let's go open this file. What is this? Uh, as you can see here, with this, uh, it's matching this rule. It's saying that it's real. Which is uh, actually we can hear the rule set. I don't know if you saw this feature, which is pretty new, uh, but this is very nice. You can see that we have some context about this. All right. Now we want to check if there are similar files in our systems. What can we do? Um, so in order to check for similarity, well, first of all, as I promised, if you go here, you see all these hashes, right? The SSD, authentic hash, we hash, so you can just click and search for something. But if we go here, uh, we can search for similar files and actually we can open all of them if we want. So let's do that, uh, which is saving us uh, some clicks. So why not? Now uh, you can see that in the different tabs, we have the different similarities. So the first one is similar to, as I told you, is this B hash uh, fuzzy. Then we have code similar to, we don't find any matches by code similarity, code blocks. D header uh, hash, this is interesting. SSD is still running. And then we have the hash, which is behavior. So what can we do with something like that? Uh, well, we can actually go here maybe, and we can select a bunch. And here we have uh, something cool. I don't know if you have seen this button, but basically this is showing you all the commonalities. So let's see what they have in common. Um, for instance, we have a lot of data. We see that 20 items have like four sections, which is not important for instance. Uh, so why I want to check from here. So if we go back to my new Ryuk sample, we see that it was created in um, September. So let's go and see what is created in September. So I can just click here. And I copy to the clipboard. So here, let's go check these files. All right. So here we find three files. And you can see, uh, yes, very quickly, they have similar size. These two are actually identical. Actually, they are uh, seen very similarly. And they have similar names. So it looks like they are like the same thing. Now, another cool thing I can do is that I can select the files that I want, and then we have this BT diff. I don't know if you know this, but this is really interesting. So what is BT diff? We'll automatically try to find what these files have in common in terms of code. So we will go for sequences of hex that they have in common. Uh, let's do so. So what, what is this useful? This is useful for us to create like nice Java rules. Uh, we can have like not only two hashes, we can have 100. Uh, well, I don't know if we can have 100, but we can have more for sure. And uh, we can check. So while we create this, I will like uh, to launch the poll. We have a poll for you guys. So if uh, our friends from SAS can share with you, uh, I put in this poll different options and we can discuss uh, what do you think? Uh, very good. So, you know, this is distraction while <laughs> this is running, but it takes a little bit, but not too much. Usually it's less than one minute. Um, even if you put more hashes, let me drink a bit. Okay. So I hope you have time to vote. Let's get back here. And here you can see that we found 40 patterns between the, the two samples that are common. So let's see if we find something interesting. Uh, actually, you see that some of them are basically strings. 
uh, you see, for instance, this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, we will never use. This is not interesting at all. But if we keep going, uh, maybe we find something that is like more eye catchy. For instance, the CMD, uh, this is interesting. Um, like this is what is executing probably. Um, we also can find, these are like some paths. I don't know if this is very relevant. Uh, this is deleting, deleting the shadow copies. Huh? This is not very nice. Uh, this is creating some tasks internally. So you see, we get here some interesting stuff that is common and that we can use. So now that we selected this, what else we can do? So the cool stuff is that we can select whatever we want. And now we can go here and create either a retro hand or a, or a life hand. Uh, so automatically create a jar rule. So let's create a retro hand. So you can see here, these are the, the different sequences of bytes that we created. And again, this is something really complicated to do by a human. Now we are with two samples, just imagine to do with 20. And we are basing the strings because this is something we can recognize, but we can just create the rule with all of them or something like that. And from here, we can create a job and we will have the retro hand running. So actually I created some of them before, uh, very similar ones. Um, you see, I found some matches like this one for matches for Ryuk. Um, you can check them here for my yard rule that I created uh, automatically. Interesting, this looks like a memory dump. Well, yes, uh, you saw how from this similarity, we can find more interesting stuff, which uh, we cannot do um, either way. We need like uh, some systems to do that for us. And this is the key of all what we are explaining today is how to make your life easier and how to be able to get something that you will not be able to do manually. And you also saw how from these searches, we are just clicking, clicking, finding like what they have in common, we can find very quickly how to how to uh, to find what they have to create these yard rules for instance okay uh i will continue because we don't have much time uh, sorry to be rushing a bit and i want to tell you about uh our ida plugin and uh, so first of all here you have uh, github where you can find our ida plugin you can download you can install and what is this doing? This is searching for a sequence of bytes of similar code. So this is more or less what we've been doing right uh, right now. Uh, we've been like searching for some sequences of bytes of uh, code. Why should we use an IDA plugin? Well, maybe because it's more convenient to do from IDA, right? Than like selecting, copying, and going to virus total. But there is a more powerful reason for this. So for instance, let's say we have this code. <clears throat> Uh, this is actually from the track. Um, what is interesting is that there are some sequences of the code that we will not be interested in. Why? Because these are the parts of the code that are like dynamic, that are like making these calls. So these calls are dependent on when the code is run, when the binary is running the system, all these memory addresses and everything. Meaning that if we go, let's say we dump something from memory and we are searching for some content, we will never find it exactly the same because it depends on every system that is running. So what is this doing for us is uh, killing all the parts of the code that are non-interesting for uh, this search. It's trying just to keep whatever is more relevant. Uh, yes, something uh, to say is that there is a, uh, code uh, similarity that is called a streak. In this case, it's not only doing the same that we, we said, but also it's keeping the constants. So depending on the situation, one thing will be more convenient than the other. Anyways, uh, what I want to do is to quickly show you, uh, because actually we have this piece of code uh, that I put in IDA, and this is from the real example. Uh, that we were taking a look. But in this case, uh, we should say that this real example is a memory dump. So we find exactly the situation we were describing. We will not be able to uh, just take this part of code and search for this into our system. So 
let me just go to the interesting part of the code uh, as I was instructed by Gerardo, who is the guy who, who knows about all this. Um, and actually, this is uh, an interesting function because in this function, uh, we can see that it was not even like uh, recognized it in this case by uh, the disassembler. So, so we have a nice chunk of code. And uh, here you see we have our Bioxelo plugin and we will search for similar code, which will open another tab. And here we can find like four samples in this case. So um, from these samples, actually, if we go click them, we see that they were detected also like real, you see three of them, not the fourth one. So our detection uh, maybe is a bit better. We, 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 we just created, you can see in the end is this content search. Right, but you can see that we have different here uh, wildcards that we are leaving for all the dynamic parts. Um, so actually, well, you can go into these calls and there is like an interesting, you can see here, as we were discussing before, like the different actions that Ryuk is doing, like starting Warpad to show you <laughs> the, the ransom node. Uh, actually, there is like this uh, string that is encrypted that is pretty good to find detection. Um, so maybe, you know, we can add this to the error rule that was detecting this uh, real malware before. Well, uh, all right. So I hope it was clear. What is the idea of why we are using uh, the plugin? As I saw, as I told you, it's like uh, helping us big time. Uh, to skip the parts that are not uh, interesting in order to make this search. Now let's move uh, to the final part of the presentation where I want to show you a little bit about BT graphs. Uh, BT graphs, I don't know if you are familiar with them, but basically it's a very cool tool to visualize uh, an investigation. So you can have like, we are now like talking about, yes, the searches, finding more artifacts, finding more stuff. Uh, what you want is to have some way to see all of it together is much easier to work with. And we can just put not only the different artifacts, but everything that is related to them, like different IOCs and all the stuff that is similar and, you know, is making our life easier. Now, uh, in reality, uh, you can go here. And actually there are like different investigations that you can take a look if you want. The investigations, they can be open. So you can create your own investigation. You can also make it private, but uh, you can go and check like if there is something interesting, like these are the top commented, the top view. Um, actually, if you are searching for something in Virus Total and this is part of some graph, you can go and jump in there. And maybe you don't even need to do the whole investigation, you will find that somebody uh, did big part of it for you. So I would like to end like this very, very small workshop uh, back to the original, oops, I'm putting this in the wrong bar, with the original search that we did at the beginning, if you remember, right? We have these five graphs, uh, sorry, these five documents. So let's see how we can make a very cool, uh, well, not, not sure if cool, but a very quick uh, investigation. So we can select all of them. And here we have the button to create the graph. Uh, this is what we are going to do. Yes, uh, to make sure you saw it, uh, is this button here. So the graph uh, will be automatically created for us with all the stuff we found. And let's see if this makes any sense. So first thing we see is that here we have one cluster. You can see here small, and here we have another one. So this is automatically making this clustering for us and making us understand if things are related or not. So let's take a look what we find here. Uh, so we have different documents, uh, for instance, this one, and this document is coming, actually all the documents are like zip files 
where you find like this uh, document itself, XML. And here we see this is, for instance, BBA, which means it's a macro that was running. And actually, this is the pattern that repeats in all of them. This second document, also we found some similar ones, which is cool. So we don't need to find by ourselves. Here is some similar stuff. Also, we have the BBA uh, here, the same. Uh, this is a bigger cluster. You see, we have all these documents. Um, again, um, so what can we do from here? We can maybe go and take a look to the VBA code, because why not? So again, we can jump into content directly. And here you see all the stuff that this VBA code is doing, the macro. So we don't need to unpack. We don't need to detonate ourselves. We don't need to go through the streams and extract. Here is everything. And actually, uh, what is this doing? Uh, so you can see this building, this is a string, user, whatever, to execute something. Uh, we can find for something that is characteristic, for instance, here, uh, like this function that is using. If these guys are lazy, when they create it, they will be reusing, or they have some framework to create that. So let's simply click and find uh, if we can find something else related to this. So you see, uh, actually, there are like several files. And you see this contract here, 50, contract 594, whatever. So this look looks to be like the same, uh, the same campaign. Also, it's the same size. Um, you can see also they use the same, um, the same lure, probably. Let's take a look to what is this. Let's go preview. This document is encrypted by DocuSign. Enable editing. So you see all, all of them using similar tricks. And we cannot actually like just go for the ones that we like, uh, the ones using this, this icon or this, uh, let's say, lure, and try to find if this is the same campaign. So you see how we are pivoting. We are just clicking here, here, here. And uh, you see we found like 340. Now, to make our life easier, let's also do the same and put every, everything in a graph. Uh, just to understand what is this, and what information can we get. Again, we are trying we are trying to save time in everything we do. We are using all these tools to make our life easier and doing things that we cannot do manually, or it will be killing to, to analyze something like that. But again, you don't need to have any knowledge of of anything. Basically, we just created this rule. Uh, from the rule, we create, we found some documents. From the documents, we were able to find by similarity. And uh, with similarity, we found related documents. We can create the YAR rule from these documents that we found. Actually, you see, these are two different clusters of activity, which is interesting. And uh, this is a pretty big one, uh, as you can see, with a lot of stuff involved. Um, for instance, let's say that we are worried about this and we want to implement some measures. So why don't we just simply you know, get all the different IPs and we download and all the URLs and we can put in our CM or we can put in our firewall or whatever. So we can protect ourselves against this campaign just with this monitoring, pivoting for, I don't know, five minutes and we can obtain all these indicators of compromise. Um, so not only that, we can also create these graphs, share with the community, uh, sharing is caring, or we can share with our minions. So you can share with your analysts and you don't need to work and they will take care of the rest. So this is some of the stuff that you can do with BT Graph, really, really powerful tool. And I recommend you to take a look if you haven't. So just to summarize, uh, I hope um, all, all, all this super quick workshop uh gave you some ideas of the kind of stuff that you can do like in terms of threat hunting in terms of modern threat, threat hunting you need like this big database where you can uh, that you can leverage and you need the tools to automate as much as you can you need like all these different possibilities to create uh like this similarity to create quickly this jara to find life with btdiff what is uh, common between different files to create something powerful and not only that, you can get contacts from the community. So you can really, really accelerate your investigations. And uh, again, uh, this threat hunting is half uh, an art and half, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, the tools that you're using, a uh, technique. So the more powerful tools, the more time you will have to think about some creative ways and some cool stuff that you can do. 
And from BT, this is the message we want to share with all of you. This is uh, basically our goal, uh, try to make your life easier and provide you with the tools that you can use to leverage your research and make it as cool as, as you want. So thank you very much. Uh, this is my last slide. I don't know if we have any questions. I, I, I have like my colleagues also checking, I, I think, the chat. I don't know if they were like trying to reply any of the questions or there were none. Uh, so thank you, Vitaly. Uh, there are some questions uh, indeed. What do you mean by Vitaly? We had enough Vitaly, man. We I'm sorry, yeah, Vicente. <laughs> one hour and a half. One hour and a half. By the way, sorry. Yeah. before we go into questions, very important is like the Easter egg. Any, any so you want, you want to go for the Easter egg first? Yes, yes. Okay. I, okay. I like it very much. Okay. <laughs> Let's do it. Vitaly is stuck in, uh, in the dense head, which, which is really cool. Vicente, thank you very much for your presentation, first of all. Thank you. Uh, give your virtual applause to Vicente Diaz. Um, Vicente, honestly speaking, nobody guessed. Like, like they, they, they're trying to find something behind the Pokemon, but nobody guessed who, who was behind. That's, that's a key in the Pokemon. I can show you guys. So yours, I still watching my screen. No, you okay. stopped sharing. All right, let me share once again. Can you see now? Uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah, let's we see. can see. Yeah. All right. So, <coughs> who is this Pokemon? Nobody, nobody found it. <laughs> Robert, 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 who I think was the first. It's Costinsor. Is the uh, Pokemon <laughs> you can find from the silhouette. All right, maybe. <laughs> yeah, funny, one. funny. Thank you, Vicente. Any questions? Maybe quick one question as soon as we're very late. Very quickly. Again, we thank have, you very much for We have yes, a lot of questions. Have, no, no, no. We have two important questions, I think. Should. And uh, one, one, one comes from um, Mohamed, who says, does Viti has any solution for anti-sandbox te techniques? Yeah, actually, well, we have not only one sandbox, we have like many sandboxes. Uh, you can actually click the one and select the one that you want to detonate your malware with. But all of them are like, you know, as we are constantly improving them to uh, try to escape all these anti sandboxing techniques. But to be honest, uh, I can provide you more details. I, I don't know all of them, but of course we do. Let me unmute myself. Thank you. So the other short question from Radu is, why does VTGREP sometimes return more results than RetroHunt? Um, do you know a case? Yeah. Yeah, because it's not against the same time window. And actually, uh, with VTGREP, I think you have a bigger time window than with RetroHunt. But you can always go for RetroHunt Pro, and you will have also a bigger time window.